This is a Nintendo GameCube, but you may notice there is something strange with this particular model. It has a rather large cartridge slot where the original DVD drive would normally be. Nintendo called this the NPDP Reader, and oddly enough, this device isn't something that has been covered extensively both here on YouTube or on the internet at large. So today, I'll not only be showing you around this unique piece of Nintendo hardware, but I'll also be tearing it down so we can see what makes this GameCube different from the rest. Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Tito and welcome to Macho Nacho Productions. Today, I am really excited because I have something special to share with you. This is not a normal Nintendo GameCube. Not sure if it's obvious enough, but it has a rather large cartridge slot on top, which I'm sure many of you have questions about, like, oh, can it play NES, SNES, or maybe even Nintendo 64 games? Well, not exactly. This is a special piece of Nintendo development hardware issued to game developers for testing and debugging new GameCube games, and it's called the NPDP Reader. This device interfaces with special NPDP cartridges, which essentially slot into the reader and can hold up to four different GameCube games. Developers use this for rapid testing since games could be copied fairly quickly to the NPDP cartridge. Now, Nintendo also released what's called an NR Reader, which is similar in functionality to the NPDP Reader, but instead utilizes special burned GameCube NR discs and very much resembles a regular GameCube system. Anyway, I'll be taking a look at that device in another video, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss out on that. Alright, in this video, I'm going to start off by walking you around the exterior of the device, showcasing all of its unique features. Then I'm going to do what's never been done before and disassemble the entire unit so we can see what makes this thing tick and what similarities and differences it has to a regular retail GameCube. Okay, so before we take a look at the MPDP reader, let's take a look at its packaging. It comes in a simple box with a very minimalist design aesthetic that I actually really dig. And clearly printed on the front is the region this unit was designed for, which in this case is the United States. Now, this isn't a complete set. I believe a complete set comes with more packaging as well as a power adapter and controller. But this gives you a taste of the packaging these development components came in, which is in pretty stark contrast to retail versions of the console. Also included is a small pamphlet that runs you through a brief overview of the kit's functions in both English and Japanese. Okay, now let's look at the MPDP reader itself. One of the first things you'll notice is the reddish, burgundy color of its shell. This color is completely unique to this kit. Commercially available GameCubes never came in this color, which is pretty cool. Okay, well, looking at the front panel, there really isn't much difference from a standard console. In fact, it's identical. Now, looking at the left side of the console, we can spot another difference. And this is the region switch, or as Nintendo calls it, the destination conversion switch. This switch essentially will change the initial program loader, or IPL, to either reflect North American or Japanese regions. According to the instructions, this switch can only be toggled when the console's off and should not be switched when it is powered on. Additionally, you'll notice the Tamper Nintendo sticker, which has already been cut. This was to prevent people from opening these dev kits. If these stickers were broken or cut, I'm sure it would void any sort of warranty that the device had from Nintendo. And since this device came with a sticker already cut, I have no issues at all opening it up to show you what's inside. Now, moving to the back, we again have much of the same. All the standard ports of a DOL-001 GameCube are all present. And on the right side of the system, we also have no unique characteristics. Now, moving to the bottom of the dev kit, we see all the same serial ports of a retail GameCube. However, the sticker label reveals some unique information. Here we can see the MPDP nomenclature, as well as its model number, DOT-002. And Nintendo has indeed branded this as a development tool. Very cool. Anyway, now let's move to the top of the console, which is where all the interesting stuff is located. Let's first take a look at the cartridge slot. One of the more notable attributes is how tall it makes the entire console. And at the bottom, you can see the port connector, which we'll be able to get a better look at once I take the whole system apart. At the base of the cartridge slot are a few buttons and LED lights. Going over the buttons, first let's start with the one all the way on the right. 
This button, when pressed, simulates opening or closing the GameCube's disc cover, which it obviously doesn't have. The next button over is for switching in between the four memory banks within the MPDP cartridge, represented by the four green LEDs. When you have a disc bank selected, you can press the open close button again, which should then boot you into the game you've selected. And the last button is labeled error. Now, according to the instruction pamphlet, this button is to produce a pseudo read error. Not exactly sure what that means, so if anyone knows what it does, leave us a comment down below. Now, how I imagine this system would work is you would first set the region that you are developing for, then insert the NPDP cartridge, turn the console on, select which disk you want to boot from, then press the open close button to initialize that virtual disk. Unfortunately, I can't demonstrate exactly how this all works because I don't have an actual MPDP cartridge to insert into the console, but that doesn't mean we can't see what happens when we plug this into a TV. I'll be hooking this up to my capture card using my Carby HDMI converter. And when I press the power button, we see this. Okay, obviously this isn't the most exciting thing in the world, but in order to get any further, we'll obviously need an NPDP cartridge. I even tried booting the dev kit with the region switch selected to Japanese and I got the same exact message on screen, checking and device not ready. Anyway, the only other things to go over on top of the reader are the power and reset buttons, which function as one would expect. The open button on the other hand, doesn't do anything for obvious reasons. There's no lid, let alone an optical drive. So that's about as much as I can show you on the exterior of the device. But now it's time to dive into the dev kit itself by completely taking it apart. And as far as I know, this will be the first ever glimpse inside this device. So let's see what secrets it holds. Okay, so taking the console apart is remarkably similar to a regular GameCube. This unit came to me with the tamper sticker already cut, so thankfully I don't have to do that. Like a regular GameCube, the first thing we need to do is remove the four 4.5mm security screws on the bottom. Once they're removed, we can go ahead and lift off the top. But we do need to be careful because there are a couple cables that link the top and the bottom together. First, we're going to remove the large flat ribbon cable, followed by the smaller cable, which is connected to the region switch. With the top shell now free, let's remove the two screws securing the region switch to the outer shell. And here it is. It's funny that Nintendo actually went through the trouble to label this component with a part number. DOT-UJSW-01. The DOT obviously stands for this dev kit model, which is, if you remember, the DOT-002. And my guess is that the UJSW stands for United States Japan Switch. Very interesting that Nintendo went through the trouble of doing this. And on the back is the JST connector. I can't believe Nintendo took the time to design this PCB for what I can only assume is a small scale production run. It's kind of fascinating. Okay, now let's see if we can remove the NPDP card slot. It appears to be connected to the top shell with these four screws. So let's start removing those. Once all the screws are out, the cartridge slot comes off very easily. Here you can see the screw holes used to mount the cart slot. It's hard to tell if these holes are part of the shell's mold or if they were drilled after. I'm gonna assume that they were drilled after the fact. Okay, now let's remove the screw securing both the button board as well as the cartridge port. With all the screws removed, we can easily lift the entire assembly out. And here's the cartridge interface board, which Nintendo has labeled as MPDP Main-02. Here we have an IC labeled IF3T HC08. It would be really interesting to know what this little chip does. And on the other side, we have more passive components and another similar IC to the one found on the other side, except this one is labeled 1F4Y HCO4. And here's a closer look at the port itself with the two beefy guide rails, which help to align the connector with the MPDP cartridge. And here we have the button and LED board. This one is labeled MPDP sub B dash 01. Again, a simple board without any integrated chips on it. This leads me to believe that most of the computing and processing is being done inside the MPDP cartridge itself, and not really through the dev kit, 
which is consistent with what I've read about the MPDP cartridge on the GC Forever Wiki, which states that the cartridge handles most of the optical drive emulation. Anyway, here's a look at the completely custom cartridge slot. This is an injection molded piece, which again is pretty remarkable that Nintendo went through the trouble of designing and manufacturing it, given what I assume to be relatively low production numbers for these types of dev kits. And even the RF shielding is custom. Nintendo had to stamp out these separate from retail GameCubes, which have a different opening for the connection between the optical drive and motherboard. All right, now let's go ahead and remove the controller panel. This process is exactly the same as a retail GameCube. After removing the controller board, we can see that it too is identical to the one from a regular console. Now let's remove the fan assembly by first unfastening these two screws. Then disconnect the fan cable from the interface board, as well as the power cable from the power switch PCB. Go ahead and remove the rear panel cover and unplug this cable, which is also connected to the power switch PCB. Then we can lift the fan assembly out and set it aside. Now we need to remove all the screws securing the upper RF shield to the bottom half of the GameCube. And there are a lot of them. Once they're all removed, we can gently lift the RF shield off, but be careful because there is a cable still connected to the interface board. Here you can see the cable originates from this hole on the motherboard and is connected to the interface board via a JST termination. So let's go ahead and remove it and then unfasten the four screws securing the interface board to the upper RF shielding. With the screws out, we can now see yet another unique piece of this dev kit which Nintendo has labeled the MPDP sub A-02 board. Again, nothing crazy, just a bunch of passive components are on the board. On the back, there are a pair of chips labeled 16AB2671. Now let's go ahead and remove the heatsink. And underneath, we find the flipper GPU, which is exactly the same as a retail GameCube's. The IBM CPU is also identical. Looking at the RAM, this unit sports the same amount as a regular GameCube. I thought perhaps that this would have additional memory, as dev kits do on occasion come with additional RAM to do more functions. Okay, now let's see where this mystery wire goes to. So let's gently pry the motherboard off the bottom shell and carefully lift it out. And upon flipping it over, we can see that the wire goes through the small hole and connects to two points on the motherboard. The black wire is connected to the left side of what appears to be capacitor C173, while the white wire is connected to a via right next to the silk screening of capacitor C230. But let me know what you all think what this is for in the comments below. And the last thing we need to do is remove the bottom RF shield, which reveals the power board. This power board is identical to what we would find on a normal console. And that's everything inside of a Nintendo GameCube NPDP reader. Okay, so now that we've seen the inside of this thing, what are some of the major takeaways? Well, I think first and foremost, this unit is very similar in terms of hardware to a regular GameCube. The motherboard appears to be identical, and really the differences occur where the GameCube's optical drive would have been. Some of the unique components we saw are the region switchboard, the NPDP sub A02 board, the MPDP main O2 board, the MPDP sub B-01 board, and the custom molded cartridge slot. These components, in addition to the system's color, are what make the MPDP reader unique. Now I'll actually have high quality photos of all these components, as well as the motherboard posted to my website in case anyone is interested in taking a closer look at them. I do hope to one day have a MPDP cartridge so that I can show you what this thing is fully capable of. But regardless, this is still an extremely unique and interesting piece of Nintendo hardware, and I'm glad to have been able to take it apart and show you all what this hardware looks like from the inside. So there you have it, the MPDP Reader Development Tool from Nintendo. An overall really cool collector's piece that unfortunately doesn't serve a purpose on its own, as you need a whole development ecosystem to practically be able to utilize it. But besides that, it is most certainly a very cool and very unique piece of Nintendo history. 
Anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next Thursday.